Hey everybody, uh, my name is Cynthia Holt and I am the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries. Um, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank you all for your interest in uh, our, our webinar today, Digital Preservation at York University Libraries. Our presenter today is Nick Gruet. Um, he is the associate uh, librarian, is an associate librarian in the Digital Scholarship Infrastructure Department at York University. And he oversees the library's preservation initiatives, along with creating and implementing systems that support the capture, description, delivery, and preservation of digital objects having significant content of enduring value. Uh, and so before we start, I would like to acknowledge that uh, all CBPA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunutsiabut and Nunutukabut, uh, the Inu of Natasinan, the Beotic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, in Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Olistokia, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at CALL CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the First Peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Um, so once again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, this uh, webinar is uh, featuring Nick Ruay, who's going to talk about digital preservation at York University Libraries. A couple of housekeeping things first. Uh, we are recording, so the recordings will be posted to the call uh, webinar page after, this, after the webinar. Um, usually it gets up the same day. Uh, also, uh, I ask that folks uh, turn off their video for the uh, uh, unless they're asking a specific question, just to save on bandwidth for our low bandwidth uh, members, and then also uh, to mute yourself through the uh, the session, the webinar, unless you're asking a question. Feel free uh, if you uh, are asking a question to unmute yourself and ask the question verbally, or you can put it in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the session. Uh, we are. Uh, uh, if possible, if you can hold your questions to the end of uh, Nick's presentation, uh, we that would work best. Uh, but if there's something you need for uh, very specific clarification for understanding of a particular point Nick is saying at, at the time, feel free to either put that in the chat or to uh, just unmute and ask that question. Uh, and um, Nick will be happy to, uh, to clarify for you. Uh, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Nick. I forgot to unmute myself before I did that. <laughs> now let's try this again. I thought it was going to be tricky and have everything all set up and ready to go. Teams is a, a little bit different. Uh, uh, this will be funny. Let's see. Here we go. All right. And we'll make this full screen. Let me get my speaker notes set up. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's it's been a long time since I've talked about digital preservation. Um, there's been a a period of time where I was pretty burned out on this type of work, uh, but I'm I'm here today talking about it again. Uh, so it was it was actually good timing and like a little bit of serendipity when when uh, Evan reached out. Um, I've been. <clears throat> uh, what I'm going to talk about today is like some of the the a little bit of like lessons learned and, and some newer work uh, of what we've done at York. Uh, and it's it's really possible because of uh, some really good colleagues that I have and uh, I, I can I can present today on like this work and be like, hey, I feel a lot better about things uh, because of them. Um, so. Um, a bit of a like an overview, like the, the introductory slides of like where I'm going to go with this is I've split it up into kind of like three time periods. I guess it's a bit of the, the historian in me or whatever um, is like the, the first chunk will be like when I started at York uh, and then the second chunk is like when uh, I disappeared, I uh, went on sabbatical and then research leave. And then uh, the last little bit is uh, 
when the our our new version of our digital preservation policy groups and working groups and everything formed uh, and what we've done. Um, so like those three time periods are going to cover like a little bit of history and a background of what we did. What uh, what didn't work, what changed, where we're at now, and then hopefully have some time for questions and discussion. Uh, it's going to be kind of a bit of a winding path uh, as I go through this. It'll be pretty casual, so if you want to interrupt and you got questions, you want clarification, um, that's cool. Um, and then uh, I, I hope it's coherent. Um, so the first chunk, uh, 2012 to 2017, um, this is basically when I started at York. Uh, and what, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we did early on um, and then some of the review processes we did and uh, we wrote a whole lot of documentation. We shared it out. Uh, I've worked with a lot of really great people on the Islandora community on, on writing tools for Islandora uh, to make uh, digital preservation happen. Um, so the, the first thing that we did when I started at York is uh, try to get like a lay of the land. Uh, and we did th this thing we called a, a systematic assessment. Uh, how York University libraries provide access to digitized content and born digital content. Um, the framework that we used here came from Penn State. Um, so it was uh, like Patricia Sway and, and, and Mike Giarlo when they were back at uh, Penn State did a similar type of thing and, and they shared what they did and we modeled uh, a version of that at York and it, this this document is huge. It's like a massive hundred some odd page Google Doc. Um, but like some key points that I think are worth like hitting out, which um, helps us really inform uh, how we would do this type of work at York is we did an environmental scan. So we looked around to, um, let's see if this, my cursor will show up here. Okay, yeah, we went around to each of the departments at the time that uh, might be key stakeholders in this type of work. So digital initiatives, which really wasn't a department, it was just uh, a person. Uh, Sound and Moving Image Library, uh, Archives and Special Collections. Uh, there's a there was a data group which was just a person. Um, the Map Library and Library and Accessibility Services. So they did a whole lot of digitizing um, for accessibility services. So try to figure out like how that type of work would play in. Uh, and same thing with uh, resource sharing for uh, interlibrary loan. Uh, then we looked at like all of our systems. Um, what we had for storage, what we needed to uh, add to storage, uh, did some gaps analysis looking at the platforms that we had that were implemented like when I was there and then just like, you know, like all those wild uh, uh, share drives of like stuff hidden here and there. Um, and then we looked at a variety of platforms, so like Islandora uh, and then uh, Hydra or Sambura uh, at the time. And uh, and then looked closer at DSpace because we had a, a DSpace instance as well, and broke it down to in a whole bunch of uh, sections and figured out if if it would meet our needs. Um, so that was kind of the first part. We did all of this work. Uh, we presented it to our colleagues at the the university, and we just started doing a whole bunch of pilot projects based on that. Uh, and Islandora was was one of them. And then the next thing that we did uh was figured like let's go big let's look at all of the uh the tdr certification stuff and uh uh figure out like what we would need to do to to get there um so like the go big or go home like let's let's see what we got to do um and luckily like right not down the street from us but like in the same uh, uh city uh is scholars portal uh it's housed at u of t uh, University of Toronto, and they had recently gone through the whole uh, TDR certification process, and they thankfully put all of their documentation out publicly. And you, th there was a framework to do this, so like we were able to look through this, review it all, and be like, "Hey, um, can we do this?" And it, it, a lot of it, like, "Yeah, I think we can do this." Um, and then we also looked at uh, some other peer institutions. So, so the one thing to, to mention about uh, the scholars portal process is like that. This was like kind of the gold standard where you you pay uh, to have this whole audit process done. Uh, it's incredibly expensive. 
uh, and <laughs> York really didn't have the money to do that. So like, what are some other options that you can look at? Um, and then we looked at University of North Texas. Uh, they do a lot of really awesome work there that I have a lot of respect for and, and really look up to. And they also were like, hey, this whole certification process is, is really expensive. Uh, is it is it worth it? Like, what do we get out of it? Um, what if we just did it uh, with another peer institution? So just had peer review. So they, they worked with uh, University of Florida uh, and they did a whole peer review of uh, uh, their TDR documentation and policies and stuff like that and, and shared it all uh, as well. So we were able, so you have like multiple institutions you can kind of look at and see like what works and what doesn't work and review it all. Um, all their documentations up. Um, I was trying to find the Florida stuff while I was working on this presentation and I found some uh, like presentations and stuff, but I couldn't find it. Um, I thought I had it all previously, but like I said, I kind of disappeared from this work for a while. And uh, uh, yeah, this is, this is what I could find. Um, and with, like when I share my slides later, like these will all be like linked out if you want to go explore around. So like using all of these um, potential TDR processes and like all of this documentation, we thought um, we could model it, our, our own local version on it. And then, you know, like the whole cliche of like fake it till you make it. Um, there, there are no red flags here at all. Uh, just kind of like taking all of this stuff and, and pulling together uh, a set of documentation. So like we did that. Um, we put it all in, in, in GitHub, put, wrote it all in Markdown. Um, I, I worked with uh, some colleagues in the Island Ore community to try to generalize this more, to, to say you could take an Island Ore instance and, and include all of these tools, and, and then here's a set of documentation to kind of get you going. Um, we, we had generalized that, so like what we had here was our policies and then preservation action plans for each kind of content type. Uh, we social we socialized it around our own organization, uh, and then like other colleagues in in Oakle because we had the digital curation community a bit. So a lot of other institutions were like, "Hey, looking at this, it might be useful." And then, like I said, the the uh, Islandor and, and Fedora communities as well. Um, <clears throat> Then, yeah, like I said earlier, I, I, I worked with some really good colleagues. I think uh, 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 Cynthia was saying Mark Jordan presented a week or so before. Uh, I worked with Mark. Uh, I worked with uh, Donald Moses. I don't know if Donald's here or not. I think most folks on this call might know him um, to uh, create a whole bunch of tools and, and, and policies and, and uh, utilities to, to work in the Island Door community on, on the old version of Island Door. And then like some names that will show up here in this post, uh, worked with a, a lot of really good community members to to make it happen. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to get at here is is we, we, we spent a lot of time uh, taking a whole bunch of documentation, putting it together, uh, taking a bunch of tools and putting it together. And then we just kind of put it out there and 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 like faked it. Like, does it work? Does this work at all? Um, we we kind of had organizational buy-in. Um, we had all the tools. We had all the policies. And and does that mean that you magically like? What does it mean to have a digital preservation program? Like, did we have it at this point in time? And I don't know. Like uh, at the time, I really believed we did. Um, but uh, what six or seven years later, I, I I don't think it worked at all. Um, and that's what we'll kind of get into here in a little bit. So, so we batch ingested, you know, like a, a million or so objects over a couple of years. Uh, and then myself and a couple of my colleagues went on sabbatical and research leaves. And uh, uh, that that core kind of group of three people. Um, so I'm trying to like one of the things I'm teasing out here is like there's probably a lot of red flags. I hope people are noticing um, is like does a digital preservation program work with like three or four people, uh, sabbaticals, research leaves, organizational moves, uh, and and one person, me, who was kind of in charge of all of this, just disappearing for five years on sabbatical and research leaves. Um, so so what happens when when some core people are away, um, and and then get to the the next period, which I called the the wilderness. 
Um, so things were a little overgrown, um, but they were working. This, this is the good thing. Um, luckily, everything that we implemented could just coast on autopilot for a few years. Um, but um, does anybody care about this work? Does anybody care in the institution? Um, is it valued uh, if, if, if something turned off or just stopped working? Would anybody even notice? So we started having like lots of discussions with my colleagues uh, about if we should even continue with this type of work and like what, what should we do? Um, and so to kind of tease some of that stuff out here, um, I figured I'd spend a, a little chunk of time talking about what I think went wrong and what might help, I guess, other institutions uh, that are trying to think about this type of stuff is um, so like one of the first things is like, do you truly have institutional support? And, and like one of the early talks I gave at York was kind of trying to tease out the differences between digital preservation and, and digital curation. And like a person can do digital preservation, but like an organization does digital curation. Um, and can that institution do it? Uh, do you have the institutional support? Do you have institutional buy-in? Do you have institutional like structure to do it? Um, and for me, early on in the organization, we really didn't have that the way things were structured. Like I lived in bibliographic services, uh, but I was kind of like a weirdo unicorn that just kind of I lived there, but wasn't part of the department and was doing all this work out of it. And there were other colleagues that lived there that like they lived in other departments that were working on this, but it was. Was it truly their their mandate and their work and stuff like that, or was it all passion? So like, can you can you build this type of stuff just on on passion um, and then staffing? So um, is one person or two two people uh, 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 that are like kind of unicorns really a digital preservation program or anything like that? And you get into like the whole coordinator syndrome type stuff. So do you have the whole institution or st structural support of the institution to do this? Um, if people leave, does it collapse in on itself or does it stand up? Um, and then also research, uh, resourcing. Um, do you have the like the hardware infrastructure to do it? Do you have the um, relationships with other colleagues and other departments to like to make this happen? Um, and then burnout. I mean, I, I suffered from burnout. Some of my other colleagues suffered from burnout. Um, I'm sure this is something a lot of people have thought about. You know, with the global pandemic and everything, and and people uh, working through that. Um, and then some of the other things is like, were we or was I too prescriptive and rigid on how we did this whole process of taking um, all of these policies and documents and saying we're just going to kind of cookie cutter, put them to it and force the organization to adapt to this instead of the organization and the people really kind of adapting the other way around. And then just kind of thoughts about the TDR certification. Is it really worth it? Um, for us, so for some institutions, it really makes sense. Um, for us, um, does it? Does it? D does that outlay of money um, um, make sense? Um, can can we actually do it? And then there we like we looked at a number of other uh, possibilities besides the, the TDR certification. There was the old data seal of approval, um, which kind of went away in 2019, or it, it, it evolved into something else. I don't remember right quite off the top of my head. Um, and then uh, finally, just really naive, like early on, uh, uh, was, was did I have just kind of rose colored glasses and, and, and just believe that like we can just do this. Um, in hindsight, I think I was really naive about a lot of this stuff. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit of what went wrong. Um, how do we get out of the wilderness? Um, or like what goes right, and so the honest answer is uh, what I call the never, never-ending migration, or our, our, our migration from uh, uh, Islandora Seven, the Drupal version, or the Drupal Seven version, to the the new version. Um, we, we've been working on it for a really long time, um, but very purposely and very, uh, I guess, focused, um, and it's really opened up a lot of stuff. Um, which is good. So just kind of looking at all of our old workflows, 
um, the way we did metadata and just kind of like this hodgepodge of stuff that we need to kind of untangle a whole lot of not necessarily technical debt, but like uh, it became technical debt, um, the kind of process debt of like how we've implemented like metadata standards and stuff like that and trying to like un unknot this whole thing. Assume you can hear my dog. Um, and then as a part of that, it's been a whole lot of meetings. Um, we've been working on this for probably two and a half years now. Um, and in this, we've just we've met like once a week and then once every two weeks um, to work through this migration. Um, and it leads us to kind of like the, the final segment of this presentation, which will be a little bit longer. Uh, which is kind of 2021 to to right now. Um, and to kind of balance of like that whole like what went wrong, I want to talk about like what's gone right, some like positive things that's that's really happened and like has given me like a new lease on life with this work. Um, and it started with like with the island or my migration group. Um, so it, uh, island or leadership group. Um, Migration Leadership Group, uh, and then out of that grew uh, a Digital Preservation Policy Working Group that did a whole lot of documentation review and documentation updates. We created a whole lot of new documentation. Uh, we did this thing called a RASCI exercise, which I'll kind of really go over in a little bit of detail here in a few minutes. Uh, we published all of our updated and new documentation, and we've uh, evolved um, some of these existing groups into new groups uh, moving forward. So a digital preservation leadership group and a digital preservation uh, working group. So um, the digital preservation working group, like this grew out of the Island or uh, migration leadership group. So that group had been meeting uh, basically once a week for like a year or so, um, sorting through like everything that needed to be done with the, the migration and that leadership group was truly a leadership group. We had uh, an associate, two associate deans on it. Uh, we had the head of archives and special collections. We had the head of my department, uh, did the digital scholarship infrastructure on it. Uh, we had myself on it and then the uh, head of uh, uh, systems um, working through everything that needed to be done. Um, and it unwrapped a whole lot of conversations uh, and allowed us to kind of get to where we're at now. Um, and so while we were working through the migration, we worked on revisiting all of the old digital preservation uh, policies and documentation. It had been kind of like a, a institutional like to do thing for a long time because a part of that documentation is a piece of documentation, which is the review cycle. So you need to review this every X number of years and revisit it and go over it. And it hadn't really been touched uh, since 2017. So five years is a pretty long time. Um, so we opened that box back up again. Um, and as we started working on it, we realized that maybe this group at the table wasn't quite the right group, and that group being the uh, Island or Migration uh, Leadership Group, and we needed to, to open it up a little bit. Um, so we put together, uh, we, we had this kind of new institutional thing where uh, as we're creating these committees and stuff like that to create like a whole terms of reference uh, and then that like put the purpose of it, the responsibilities, the timeline, um, outcomes and deliverables and uh, and membership. So the, the big things about this one I wanted to highlight are the timeline was it was going to be short. We were going to do this work, get this work done and have it be done and not have like something said as like an ongoing thing where we just kind of do it and you kind of get into the habit of oh we can kick that down the road to next week or something like that and then like three years later you're still kicking that can um so this group was formed in january uh i i, I said what i thought was an ambitious timeline but a reasonable timeline of wrapping it up by the fall and we did it by like the first week of september we were done um even with uh, a side quest I'll, I'll spend a chunk of time talking uh, we scoped out what we're going to do. Um, we, we outlined everything that we're going to review. We wrote what we want to update. 
um, and then updated that list of things we wanted to update as we went through things. Uh, we highlighted what potential new documentation we needed to do, and then we highlighted what we needed to save for later, um, which would be done probably by a working group, which is uh, updating all of our preservation action plans. Um, and then, yeah, I'll talk about the, the RASCI stuff here pretty soon as well. Um, so the other thing that we also discussed is like what the preservation cover program covers at York. Um, so in the past, like the way that we had written the documentation um, alluded, it was it was pretty focused on uh, York University Digital Library, which is our island or instance, which is just mostly like cultural heritage objects. Um, it alluded to York space, um, but didn't outright say it in every piece of documentation. And York space is our D space instance, uh, which is kind of like all of the like academic output of the university. So uh, like what, what you would traditionally see in an in institutional repository. So like articles, dissertations, presentations, that type of stuff. So we, we try to keep a, a pretty clear line between the two um, and it works most of the time. Um, and then in the current one, uh, the current version of like all of the documentation pulls in of a lot of other things that have come up um, over the years, but also that were kind of like left out in the cold and weren't quite um, covered by it. And one of those big things being York University uh, digital journals. So this is like all the, the journals we host in our OJS sets. So things there that uh, are part of like a journal issue or anything like that. So any audio or video, like where does that stuff, how does that come in? How did the actual issues come in? And then we also have an archive Matica pilot um, now um that we're working on so that's mostly for common record schedule stuff but also like born digital uh materials that come into archives and special collections for processing and then i have web archives here and in, in italics uh because we have a very nascent uh web archiving program um it's me doing it in like one percent of my time but like that falls under um digital preservation and it, and it sits there but we haven't quite hashed out uh, what we want or how we want to write policies and stuff like that as an organization. Um, OK, so rewriting uh, all of our policies and, and documentation. So like I said previously, we when, when learning uh, how not to be so prescriptive or, or rigid in how we do stuff like in the past, it was all uh, written in Markdown. It was in GitHub. Uh, it was all version controlled via Git. Um, from my perspective, I think that's really great and it's good. Um, but when you got eight or nine other colleagues that you're collaborating with, it probably won't work with them. Um, so kind of coming to them instead of like forcing them to come to me and and, and, and use like this this process, which I think makes sense. Um, we can do it in Office 365. So we I, I moved everything over to Office 365 and we we're able to just kind of collaboratively go through all of these documents. And you'll see here that we have it kind of split up into a public audience and a uh, uh, an internal audience. So trying to figure out how and uh, uh, how what audience should these be written for. So it makes a lot of sense for some of this stuff to be public and out there because that's what you're saying about your digital preservation program. But a lot of it is also very kind of prescriptive and like these things happen eternal, internally and it doesn't really make sense to an outside audience and it might confuse people um, or. Or I mean, it just it just makes sense it to be like in an internal website, um, but this isn't to say that nobody external can ever see this. If people want to see this, I'm happy to, to share this type of stuff. It just kind of. For me, it makes more sense to have it kind of split like this now, um, and this is like what it looks like now. This is like on our internal site. Um, this is all of the documentation that we've done. Um, we've updated our collection policy. We've updated the uh, designated community. Uh, we have a glossary of terms. We have our implementation plan. So some of this is all like all the old stuff that was that was done. Um, but probably the biggest thing that we did before or that we did is we have this new document that's just called digital preservation because quite didn't know what to call it. Um, but the way I saw all of the the documentation previously and just being familiar with OAS or it, like all of the kind of 
traditional ways to do this type of documentation. There was never like an introduction document to this, like a way to kind of jump in. For me, I'd always say you look at the, like the collection policy or the designated community as a way to get into the documentation and it just kind of like spirals out from there. Or it's kind of like a web. Um, and that didn't make sense for a lot of my colleagues or a lot of people working on this. And I, I want all of this to be like approachable and human readable. Um, and if it's if it, I think that really matters a lot now for like a like any type of digital preservation program, like you don't need to be like this digital preservation walk and only only like the wonky people can understand digital preservation. Like I, I don't think digital preservation works like that if you if you true if you want to be successful. Um, so that's like one of my other many lessons learned from this uh, and then all of the kind of YUL focused stuff or the human resource plan, uh, which I'll jump into here in a few, or I think the next slide. Um, and then the OAIS stuff, and then like the really traditional like OAS stuff, like the apes, sips, and dips, and stuff like that, and the backup plan, and how we do fixity and file format identification or characterization. Um, so, uh, we had one particular piece of documentation uh, in our old documentation that I've been trying to get the organization to kind of come together and talk about and figure out for a long time. And it came from scholars portal documentation. It was called succession planning and it was like my way or spin of thinking on it. Um, so the succession planning for scholars portal is um, what to do if scholars portal doesn't exist anymore. Like what happens to the TDR? But the way I thought about it is like literally like succession planning, like as human beings coming in and out of the organization, how does this this work? And I think that's a very important part of documentation for like a preservation program to have. And we could never kind of get there with it. Um, and the way like when we got to this document um, that we were going to write uh, as the as the groups were meeting, uh, one of my colleagues, Jennifer Grant, suggested that we do a RASCI exercise and this really might help uh, figure it out. And what a is, is it's, it's, it's an acronym. Uh, it stands for Responsibility Assignment Matrix. And if you're not familiar with it, um, it's it's really, it, it was really cathartic um, for this whole group to kind of go through. And what you do is you, you, you break things down into tasks uh, and you go through tasks and roles. Uh, and you go through for each one of those tasks and each role and discuss who is responsible, who is accountable, who supports this, who's consulted this, who's informed or just who's left blank. Uh, and when you have like a complicated thing like digital preservation and like all of these different platforms, you have point people for these different platforms and different type of support things set up. Um, and different people. So we've had a lot of new people in the organization. It really helped uh, tease uh, that out. Um, so we looked at it for York University Digital Library, so our Island Door instance, uh, York Space or DSpace instance, York Digital Journals or OJS instance, and our Archive Medica pilot. And and I, I really do mean this was like cathartic in a really good way. Uh, like we spent about three months. Like it was really a side quest. Um, and we're st still able to finish this whole thing on time. Um, it was nine people sitting around like a virtual table for three months and talking out each and every role and task for every platform. And um, how we broke it up uh, is we broke it up into a few different sections that I'll go over. Uh, we have a, a governance section and in that governance section, the tasks or like mission and vision, uh, funding, decision making, policy, risk management, and resource planning. And then we had just like for each platform, we had uh, we broke it up into administration. So looking at the strategy, strategy and assessment for each platform and then collecting statistics about it. And then like the system side of things. So backup security, hardware and software configuration and maintenance, uh, looking at logging, who's responsible for that, and then disaster recovery. Um, so like kind of teasing out some nuances there between like backup and, and stuff like that. Um, and then looking at collections and donors for each one of these, because so it's not necessarily donors for each one and it's collections for other things. Um, so collection development, donor deposit relations, 
uh, and then deposit agreements. And then when the objects go into a particular platform, so the submission part of that, so looking at digitization, uh, which we spent a whole lot of time on, uh, and then object, meta, object metadata specifications, uh, descriptive metadata creation, and then quality control around the objects themselves, but then also the metadata, uh, who's responsible for copyright management, uh, who's responsible for property rights and restrictions on these, so like figuring out the authorization on them. Um, and then getting them into the system. So who has permissions to do this? Um, who is responsible for creating the workflow around this? Who is responsible for actually doing the ingest? Who is responsible for the object identification and characterization? The integrity, so like the fixity on those. Um, the records, records or records of actions taken on objects. So that's like thinking about the premise side of things. And then who is responsible for getting things out of there, like deaccessioning or purging them? And then finally, the, the like the last two kind of categories of uh, 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 tasks were in the object dissemination side, so access control for these things. Uh, then who's responsible for user support? And then onboarding and training, so who's responsible for writing policies around this application support, application use, uh, figuring out departmental roles, and then writing training documentation. Um, and so yeah like i said before like we we started that group the preservation policy working group in january uh of this year and we wrapped up by uh the first week of september so then everything so one of one of the coolest things is previously all of that digital preservation documentation just lived on like the york university digital library site so it's just kind of like very niche site of the organization, like you kind of get here, you get here, you get here, and then here's the preservation documentation for the library. Um, one of the the things I'm, I'm I'm most proud about all of this is the all of the preservation documentation that's public facing now lives on the library website in a place that makes sense. It's on our about us page where all the policies are. Like you click on digital preservation, and then you get to this page that I kind of mentioned previously. The preservation policy, the like the introduction document. Um, in here we talk about our mandate, um, link it to the strategic plan and the university strategic plan. We outline our principles, our scope, our roles and responsibility, what the financial commitment is, um, skills and training required, and then the review and revision. And then link out to like all of those like spidered out uh, uh, like sub documents that are related to this. So the collection policy, what the designated community is, how we implement metadata standards, all that type of stuff. Um, and so like we did that. So like the the core mandate of this group is all done. So so what happens next um, after we published everything and said, hey, we're done. And one way I kind of like to frame it is this came out like after we did this. Uh, this was after uh, uh, Bruno Latour died, um, but it, it really speaks to. How I, I see my work in the digital scholarship infrastructure department, but also like the digital preservation work. Um, and I'll just read it. Uh, digital infrastructure is not robust like a brick. It's not inherently hard. It's robust like a tree. It lasts because it grows, adapts, repairs. It may also die. Uh, we have to keep it alive and it demands care. Um, so how do we, so if you think about like digital preservation, um, like it's like this, it's exactly like this. So like, how do we keep it alive and how do we take care of it? Um, which I don't think we did before. We, we, we were really bad at taking care of it. Um, and the way that we're moving forward with it, if it works, it works. If not, we, we're, we're, we'll figure out a way to adapt. As we've split, um, into two groups. We have a digital preservation leadership group. Um, its primary purpose is to resource and prioritize projects that ensure, ensure sustainability of York University Library's digital preservation program through collaboration and the preparation of work plans, budget submissions, staffing, uh, staff planning, and, and doing annual reports. So this is the group with associate deans and department heads at the table trying to figure out how to resource this and make it happen. Um, so this is one of the giant things that failed previously that now we've, I think we fixed, and this is like a really good thing. Like this group meets frequently, um, 
and we have really great discussions. Um, so that's like kind of like the leadership side of things, but then there's the the doing side of things of like actually doing the work. Um, and I live in, in, in both of these groups. I'm one of two people that live in most, both of these groups. And the preservation working group is its primary purpose is to bring together individuals from the division. So this is multiple divisions uh, and, and our organization, uh, the digital engagement strategy division and the division of research and open scholarship. So like I live in digital scholarship on the engagement strategy side and then archives and uh, special collections li live on the, the research and open scholarship side, or I might have that backwards. Um, I probably do. Um, and then so these are just basically everybody, those nine people who are involved in, in working this. So this is like one other thing that's changed is it's not just three people kind of doing this. Um, we now have like a, a, a group of people doing this now, and it's, it's really, really great. Um, and so I want to thank them uh, publicly. Uh, Katrina Cohen Palacios, uh, Sarah Koish, uh, Jennifer Grant, Jenny John, uh, Andrea Kosovic, Michael Moyer, Tomasz Morsevsky, I hope I got that right, Tuan Yuan, and uh, Harriet South. Uh, and then, kind of a little bit of a conclusion here. Um, my lessons learned uh, and, and how to do this if you're doing a digital preservation program, um, identify what you can do, write down what you can do. Uh, do what you say you can do. Uh, don't overdo it. Um, it's a big thing. Um, figure out where you want to go next. Figure out how you want to get there. Uh, and don't be afraid to stop and figure out a new way of things to change. And then another thing is just like reach out and talk to people. Um, and that's it. Um, I can open it up for questions, uh, comments, or anything like that, discussions. Thank you. Bolalio. Thank you very much, Nick. That was really great. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, and it looks like you're getting a lot of clapping. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> so I'm opening up now. Uh, if anybody <clears throat> has a question they'd like to ask, you can either unmute and say it verbally or put it in the chat. Uh, please feel free. Oh, Joyce. Hi, uh, Nick, I just want to say Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I've, I'm a digital services librarian at uh, St. Mary's. We're nowhere near the point of having a, um, you know, a large, robust digital um, preserva preservation program. Where I'm just barely learning the difference between having a digitized object and having digital preservation. And I've been thinking in my mind for years as I've seen the national infrastructure uh, coalescing around digital scholarship, um, all the various things that we've worked on in little groups that have come together nationally. And it has always seemed to me that what we're what we're missing in the in the digital um, digital information resources, what we're missing in that world is, a robust structure like what we've developed over several hundred years in libraries that take care of traditional collections. And what you've described puts the meat on the bones. And I am just so excited to see it. And I really hope, I the biggest problem, and I'm glad you talked quite a bit about human resources because the biggest problem seems to be this work is so invisible. And when it's uh, when it's um, computer peeps doing it off the side of their desk, it's even more invisible because they're, they're they're doing it in GitHub and they're doing it in ways that are so opaque that you can't even get someone. You can't even have a conversation with people on the outside and the labor is completely invisible. And I think that's a real challenge for us. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how how the human resources piece gets dealt with in the face of it being so invisible. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, uh, <laughs> an easy question. I'm just I'm just riffing and uh, inspired here. So please, any comments you care to make? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, how, how it kind of got dealt with with me was like I burned out really bad and I hated it and I didn't really want to do it anymore. And I talked to my colleagues about that and I was like, I had to like how we got to this point that I didn't explicitly say is uh, I, I told that leadership group 
I, I, I wrote a message and I said, I, I don't know if we should go down this path again. I don't know if anybody cares about this um, and like highlighting a lot of this kind of invisible labor um, and a lot of stuff that, like you said, like it's the, the computer people in the organization that like you just do this stuff and people think it's kind of magical and you do this and you can keep on going forever, um, but you don't. It requires a, a whole lot of um, like uh, rigor and like academic thought and this. It's not just kind of like automatic where it just kind of goes. Um, so like teasing all that out and the way that it worked uh, uh, is like that whole Rasky thing. Like it, it might look silly or seem like a cliche thing, but like if you do it, um, and you take care and you approach it all like with empathy and uh, uh, I, I found it really worked uh, and, and my colleagues, I think what really worked there is like everybody took it seriously. It wasn't like kind of like a joke or anything like that. We spent a lot of time on it. Um, I, does, does that answer it? Like, it, it, like yes. really it was. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. And I under, I really get the burnout thing. I've, I've witnessed it all over the place and uh, I, I really appreciate that process. I'm going to check that out because uh, I think, um, you know, early in my career, um, a lot of the librarians I was involved with, we invested a lot of time in these kinds of exercises. And then we reached a kind of point where we, you know, we thought we knew enough that we didn't really have to do that. Now it just seemed like a lot of waste of time, but it's not. The, there are these uh, processes that really help to illuminate ex so that everyone, so that you all know what you're doing and what has to be done. And I, I think it's brilliant. So thank you very much. And you hang in there. I'm glad things are looking up. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question in the chat from Greg Davies. Uh, to go back to the 2012-2017 period, you mentioned the importance of organizational buy-in. Can you elaborate a little on what you meant by that and which, which organization, if any, bought into the project at York. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so organizational buy in, I meant like the organization like York, York, like York University, but also like specifically York University Libraries. Um, so like things that I didn't explicitly say is like we had. Uh, so when I started at the university, we had a dean um, and then that dean retired, retired and then we had a search and the search that failed. So we had a interim dean for a library a while and then we had a new dean so it's just kind of like there was the shifting organizational uh structure uh while we were trying to implement this early on um so it's kind of like trying to build this thing like on a really bad foundation uh where you have like one um set of like organizational leadership that are saying like this is really important go out and do it and talking all this up but not giving any what kind of resources and saying oh it's kind of that like oh the computer people will just kind of figure it out we hired we hired nick he's a magical unicorn he'll just like do it um and then and then you and then you burn out um does does that make sense greg okay cool yeah and so like now i would say like we have organizational buy-in and we have the structure and support because we have uh organizational leadership at the table to, to make this happen. And they're there like frequently and a part, like very vested parts of the conversation. And that's in incredibly important. So there's a comment from Trish in the chat. Uh, Trish LeBlanc, in a previous, oh, it keeps moving. In a previous job, we raskied every new proposed initiative. It was extremely useful because things either died or were fully embraced. Yeah, it's the, the, the rescue stuff is just great for just kind of clarifying like who's responsible for what and like breaking down a lot of like barriers between departments that might not really talk to each other, but you're like, hey, is systems doing this or is or is archives responsible for this? And there's like that kind of glut of things that are that gray area in between um, and sorting all that type of stuff out. It, yeah, it's it's great. Uh, we have a question in the chat yeah. from Pam Mayer. Yeah, I see it. Okay, yeah, is it even worth it? Uh, yeah, I, it is. So one of the old talks I used to give, 
it's, it's kind of like wrapped up in that conclusion thing. I didn't do a very good job of tying things together. Um, is uh, is that whole like say what you can do and do what you can say. So just like write down like what you do. Um, I would so what I would say is like look at documentation that's out there and spend some time with it and and see if you can see yourself or your organization to end any any of that type of uh, a work, work or like any of those policies or documentation. And if you do kind of say what you can do and say what you can't do and kind of try to figure out a path. I don't I don't know if that makes sense. Um, that's that's the way I've always kind of looked at it. Um, and I guess it's just like the organizational mandate too. Um, I, usually we're all memory institutions, but kind of the one unfortunate thing is uh, we, we don't get funded very well for something that's supposed to be preserved for a long, long time. I don't, yeah. Does that answer? I don't know. Uh, so I'm not, any other questions from the group? Uh, not seeing anything in the chat uh, or any hands. Pam says she thinks that answers it. <laughs> Um, so I don't see any more questions, uh, so I'd like to thank you, Nick, once again uh, for a fantastic uh, presentation and, and, and really just a deep dive into the minutia of, of, of how, how to not burn out <laughs> or how to recover if you are burning out um, and, and, and to turn it around to actually make the program productive or effective. Um, uh, without killing your staff. Um, so uh, I'm being a little <laughs> bit broad-handed there, but uh, it, it, it seems it sounds like the, these projects do take a lot out of the staff in them and and in uh, making sure that they're properly resourced and scoped uh, seems to be a big focus for making sure that it we, you don't hit that wall in your preservation program. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, and and, and uh, I'm sure my our members, uh, Call and Copel, um, have learned a lot and will take a lot out. Are you open to being contacted if somebody had uh, a follow up question or? Um, yeah, 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 for sure. I'll I'll, uh, I'll get I'll get my slides. I'll clean them up here a bit. I'll share those, and then if folks want to see any of that internal documentation or anything like that, I'm happy to share it. Or if you have questions and you want to see like or the the rescue process and stuff like that i'm i'm happy to answer yeah excellent thank you so much nick and uh, as i said before everybody i will have that posted uh, very soon uh, the recording and nick slides uh, to the call website uh, webinars page and uh, i will also send a direct email out to everybody who registered for the session uh, with the link to the uh, recording Looks like we're getting lots of claps. Thank you very much, Nick. And you have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care.